Hello everyone, it's been some time and boy, what a year we are having. It's been seven months since we stayed indoors and many of us have found other ways to keep in touch and to continue with business as normal as we possibly can. There's definitely been no shortages of Zoom conferences, webinars and live demos. And I salute those who have embraced the digital form right from the start, like me. And to keep up with the times in this new norm, we started on our own little digital adventure too. Introducing Map TV with me, Toby, as your host. This is your 30 minute once a month program where we hope you will join us as we share news, info, and tips from the industry. In this first webisode, we visited BGR to see how they have kept busy throughout the movement control order with some crazy ideas and how Cook Chill has helped them serve from big groups to the individual meal today. We also have a takeaway <coughs> session where we spoke to Ben Gregory of Level Studio on the change that we are experiencing when it comes to eating out in the new norm. And stay tuned to the last segment as we went on a couple of tours too. A visit to Typhex Anuga in Bangkok and also a new facility for an event that we had great plans for. More to come. So we hope that you will spend some time with us. And first up, join Cathy as Mr. So shows us how he's serving the usually fried Mi Hoon, but without the wok, and how Cook Chill works effectively for many or for one. Take it away, Cat. Okay. Okay. So, can you explain a little bit how what was what goes into this process? I mean, it, I'm sure it wasn't something that was so easy to just remove the wok and still serve a fry. Item. Right. You see, the biggest issue always with frying of a, a dish like this, where it consists of bee hoon, is Correct. it requires a lot of skills for um, what do you call for a chef to fry the bee hoon. The biggest common uh, errors is that. Uh, when you fry too hard or you don't have the relevant skill, the noodles breaks and it becomes you know, chopped up in small little yeah. pieces which makes it a less enjoyable experience. So with that in mind, we ask a very fundamental question to say that, you know, is there a possibility that I can fry without breaking the noodles? That's number one. Yeah. Number two, can I cook this dish without the need for a skilled chef? So one of the things we did during our initial stage of R&D was what if we were to cook it sous vide? and how long does it take to cook it sous vide. So after all the testing and all these things, we finally managed to come up with a recipe and a methodology whereby we pack the bee hoon uh, together with the seasoning and whatnot into a vacuum bag. And the re-thermalization process that requires for this bee hoon to be cooked is approximately three minutes from chew. And during these three minutes while the bag is inside the, uh, what do you call, uh, the, the hot water bath or thermal circulator, um, we will have the time to fry some of the spring rolls and you know uh, chicken rolls and all these things and also fry the egg. So once the bee hoon is actually heated up, the rest of the items are completed. We now will be able to just assemble it and we have the sauce that is already pre-packed, sachet portion for individual portioning. We just drizzle it around. The whole dish will take approximately no more than five minutes to prepare, which is amazing in terms of order to delivery time frame. The other amazing thing is you told me that the noodle actually goes in raw. Yes. So the noodles actually, we soak it, we put in the seasoning, we put in raw and actually we freeze it. So in that, in that manner, we will still be able to at least you know, get a six months shelf life out of it. And when we defrost it, I can easily still get a three to five days shelf life out of it. So that means to say that I'm actually not wasting anything at all. And, uh, and, and, and even if I don't get an order today, tomorrow I will still be able to use it and so on and so forth. So the quality uh, and the taste is as you have tasted it. You know, it is, um, it's, if, if I didn't tell you the processes yeah. behind, I'm very sure that you would think that somebody <laughs> fried it, you know, Correct. at the back. Yes. Yeah. In fact, actually, I was very surprised. Yeah. I was actually expecting a wok <laughs> uh, in place. Yeah. Right? So one of the things that we removed from our kitchen recently is there's no more wok in the kitchen. Other than maybe a robotic one, but that's a different story for another day. Okay, so um, are you exploring with any other fried items for, especially, I mean, something with a wok? Okay, so uh, we actually came out with a system, a, a robot wok system, where we actually can fried rice uh, without the requirement of a trained chef in one minute. Mm. So for the whole process only takes one minute uh, from the beginning all the way to the end, where you get a piping hot portion of uh, fried rice. Uh, that can be done. 
Uh, other than that, um, there are limitations as well. So I can fry bihun, I can fry rice, you know, but if you talk about things like kuei tiao and all these things, then it becomes a little bit more tricky. Or you talk about noodles, you know, yellow mee or whatever, it just becomes a little bit more tricky. So there are other ways you make use of other methods and other techniques to deliver certain, you know, menus. So that's why I said, you know, it's not a magic bullet. You know, Kukchu is never a magic bullet. It's not about doing things that you usually traditionally do using a wok. You have to think through the process, come up with an engineering of the menu, making use of the best technology that is available, and create a operational solution whereby you know, it's easy to train uh, and uh, anybody will be able to do the job. Okay. The last few months for everybody is mm. the question of MCO. Yep. Right? How was it for you, for your business? Well, I mean, of course, if uh, the MCO period, you know, of course, uh, business was almost down to zero, you know, because uh, down here, especially at the golf resort, we specialize on a couple of things. Of course, we have golfers, we have weddings, we have events, we have functions. Uh, during the MCO period, I have nothing. So basically, we have zero business. We all know, I mean, everybody yeah. in, in the F&B industry were in the same kind of boat. Yes. But uh, and actually a lot of them moved to what we call the delivery business. Right. Did you get on the wagon as well? Uh, we did a little bit of the delivery business because, you know, when you have nothing going on, you start to have a lot of time to think and, you know, when everyone is doing delivery, you join on a bandwagon and you kind of do that as well. Correct. Uh, but we realized that, you know, it's not so easy to just jump into the delivery business without a proper, you know, business model, without really thinking about it, yeah. without getting the infrastructure right. You know, um, and I wouldn't say that it's a huge uh, success for us, but I would say that we have learned a lot of things during that period, which actually will, is actually helping us during this period that we are starting we into are the recovery, recovery process. Yeah. You know, okay. one of the things that we actually did was, uh, you know, uh, things like, you know, uh, something like this, whereby this is nasi brani and mm -hmm. this is uh, ayam brani. Yep. You know, during the MCO period, everybody was uh, ordering, taking away. So, you know, we came out with products like this, where we are actually able to offer our customers uh, coal, mm -hmm. uh, or even we heat it up and we send it out for customers. Okay. Um, Yep. But I think it gave you an advantage over a lot of other businesses who oh, were yes. not prepared. Oh yes, so like for example, because if we are doing all these things of via cook chill or mm. cook freeze, I have a longevity of about 18 months. Oh. So whatever that I did not use during the MCO period, well, I'm still selling it now, right? Because, yes. you know, MCO is only about, you know, four, six months ago, Correct. probably, and uh, this can easily last for 18 months. But one question on top of it, I mean, sure. now that you're packing in a smaller volume, right? Yep. So do you think this now is even more important than packing in a bigger volume like before? Well, I would say that it is very different. I mean, these are all for individual portionings whereby, you know, individual customers want it and all these things. Uh, whereas in the past, you know, we were doing events and banquets, so, you know, the larger packaging makes sense. Mm. Uh, this, however, now becomes a very nice model because during, ever since the MCO was over, even halfway through the MCO, a lot of businesses are really looking at the way that they do businesses. Right. You know, it's no longer about bulk. It's about, you know, how can I do things more effectively? Yes. You know, how can I save more money? And of right. course, during the process, a lot of people got retrenched. Yes. A lot of people, you know, had salary cut and resulting in disgruntled, you know, <laughs> employees. And now we have to ask, you know, what is the best way to move forward you know, adhering to certain quality and standards while not having uh, a too uh, highly skilled uh, you Correct, know, personnel yeah. to, Labor. you know, yeah. to, to, to prepare the food. Because, you know, like, like, like I said, nasi brani, you usually need a good chef to cook all these yes, things, right? So if somebody were to take this and say, you know, let's heat it up with a pot of hot water and yeah. serve it my customer, how different would that be? Okay, so with delivery being now the most sought after yeah. way of, you know, doing business, how, how do you think Cook Chill can actually contribute to, okay. to that? Okay, delivery business at the end of the day, you only have a catchment of probably one kilometer or two kilometer around you, mm. ideally. Of course, now it's gone up to five, ten yes, kilometers. Right. But the longer the delivery time, the, long, the, 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 the worse the food will taste because yeah. if you, I'm spending you know, half an hour in the delivery process, yes. then you know, of course you're not going to get very nice food. Correct. So as companies think about that, they will say that, you know what? The best way to actually have a delivery business is to have as many outlets as possible, mm. capturing you know, the, uh, the, 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 the catchment yeah. area of wherever they are targeting. So with this, your biggest issue is if I have so many kitchens, what is the capital cost? Correct. So if I were to tell you a kitchen that requires hot water probably only takes up about this space, yeah. which is about say 100 to 150 square feet, mm. you know, um, that becomes cheap to rent. Yep. And once it's cheap to rent, 
now you know that the business model is a lot more feasible. The second thing is if you're branching so many outlets, Correct. okay, um, then you have issues of consistency, you have issues of mending. Yes. So in these two cases, when I have a small kitchen, I don't have ability to put a lot of equipments for the cooking process. Yeah. If I don't have a lot of skilled personnel and I want to maintain the consistency, the only solution is to have everything cooked in the central kitchen. I just bring it to the place, heat it up in a small kitchen environment done okay. by part-timers ah, or somebody okay. that probably only takes, you know, one hour of training. I mean, look at it, Cathy. How long, how long do you think I need to do to train you to hit this up? You know, yeah, through the course of this interview, probably you already know how exactly to do it. And yes. if I would say, Cathy, do it yourself, after you know, I walk out for a cup of coffee, you will be able to do it very, very, very easily. Okay. Okay? Yep. Welcome back. As a concept consultant, Level Studio is an experiential design studio that specializes in the ideation, design, and execution of memorable culinary experiences in the hospitality world. We sat down with Ben Gregory, principal of Level Studio in his new office in the heart of KL, where he shared his insights from the changes we should expect and his takeaway experiences from restaurants in the new norm. Yeah, well, we started this year with a lot of optimism, as I think most people did. Um, and moving here was always sort of in the cards. We always had a plan to kind of um, move out, uh, set up our own shop here. Um, but plans had changed, and I think that's how everybody in the industry has kind of had to relook at their strategies for the year. Um, that being said, I mean, I, we still try and look at everything as a glass half full, try and be optimistic. You know, we do hear some. Some positivity in the local market here, you know, people talking about building new projects or renovations on existing ones. Um, but yeah, it's all wait and see right now. Unfortunately, we're still about seven, eight months into this pandemic and uh, we'll probably look back at this a year from now and hopefully we're out of it, but we'll see. Well, I mean, it's, we're still only really two months here in Malaysia since we've actually opened up again and uh, we've seen restaurants going from completely social distancing or only doing takeaway to slowly getting people back in um, as cases are getting fewer and fewer people got more comfortable restaurants starting in a little bit closer seating and things like that but and then you suddenly see a spike and things go back to what they were so it's really hard to give a, a clear answer on that because we still don't know uh, but I, I'm looking at certain kind of restaurants are having to really evolve their menus how they run their operations um, whether it's scheduled seating times, they can't just have people walk in like they used to. Um, that's more and more at the fine dining set and we see people doing a lot more set menus that are pre-priced. So you almost buy in advance, which helps protect a lot of operators because you know people may last minute decide they're not going to come. And if you lose a whole table of say five or six people, a few of those a night, that can be your whole revenue. Any profit you're going to make that night can be gone just because of walk-ins that didn't show up or reservations that didn't show up, I should say. So. Yeah, I mean, every, every segment is different, you know. Quick service is still doing a lot of grab food, takeaway, things like that. And I think that'll continue to, to persevere even past when this pandemic ends. People are so used to doing it now. So, um, yeah, trends, some, some trends like that will be here to stay, I believe.
Again, it goes back to the individual restaurant. I mean, I can think of a few that I like here in town and how their stance is they deliver or they use third parties that aren't Grab or Food Panda, because I think a lot of the issues with that is they take a large percentage of the fee and, and it really doesn't make it much pro or very profitable for them. So some of those guys, I think they're, they're surviving and they're doing quite well because they had a good following and people are starting to go back to their restaurants, but they had a very tough start to the year and I think it's still not, they're still in the red for a lot of them, right? But looking at how they're going to evolve past this, it's anybody's guess right now, I still think. I think tr trends like having grab food is very convenient for a lot of people. It's convenient to restaurants where you don't, you have very little connection with. But if I think some restaurants in this area where I know the owners, I want to go visit them, I want to support them. Even though I may spend the same amount on grab food, I'm at least they're visible, talking to them. I think that kind of, that really comes back to hospitality and the guest experience, which you want to continue to kind of happen. Grab food is very disconnected and you're only connected to the grab driver or the app, right? You have no connection to the restaurant. and. If you're going to think you're going to survive on a business model just through grab food, I don't think you're going to last more than maybe till the end of the pandemic, even longer, right? Who knows? Um, I've seen some restaurants do some very nice packaging. Um, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking Antier at the Alila Hotel here. They do like a Basque cheesecake. And when it gets delivered, instead of just being in a grab food in a plastic bag, it comes very hand wrapped with string and a nice box and a little note to it. Like those little like added value. And when you see in those kind of restaurants, it's, it's a personal touch and it doesn't cost that much rather than you know ordering some curry takeaway that comes in a sloppy box and it's messy and all that it's really it doesn't do much for your brand when it gets delivered so i think if you are relying on delivery to get most of your food out there and still reach your customers trying to think about the packaging even the style of meals you know uh, i spoke to a bunch of people who are not really adjusting menus and they're thinking oh we just have our full menu we put it on grab and done when really it's some of those food doesn't travel very well you know for example some seafood won't travel you're trying to do a whole fish and pack it you have to buy special packaging and all that if that's really your signature item and it does travel well think of how you're packaging don't maybe just go as get the cheapest takeaway box i know cost is an issue but also taste and quality there's over mco when we had food delivered some food was great others it's great in the restaurant and you get the same dish delivered and it was horrible and again that doesn't really reflect well on your brand and you can't blame grab for that too you know so i think you got to think about your menu perhaps narrow it down to a small takeaway menu whereas if you're in-house maybe that's the added value of going to the restaurant because oh they have the the full menu there and things that you whether you used to know or you want to try things that you see on instagram that definitely don't look the same when they come at home so uh, I think there is, yeah, you got to think about that F&B strategy there. And when we do concepts and looking at every aspect of the guest experience, and although takeaway isn't something we address full on, I think now when we're doing future work and concepts, especially for restaurants who are going to rely on that, we have to think about takeaway packaging. Asian food is very broad, right? Yeah. I think um, the ones I've seen do well, I think, are ones who can do some of the vacuum packing where they make like something like a laksa. You can pack all the sauce and assemble at home. That works quite well. Um, I had some Vietnamese food a couple of weeks ago and all the pho came all separated and you just put it together, which traveled well for a dish like noodles. If you made it and tried to take it 25 minutes on a grab bike, it would taste like, it would taste horrible by the time it got there, right? Um, yeah, and other brands, I mean, like hot pot restaurants, I see they kind of let you assemble at home as well. I think that's the only way that you can try and achieve optimum freshness for that kind of food. I mean, if you're going to have a char kway tiao and get it delivered, it's not going to taste that great by the time it gets to you. But then that's why people still want to go out and get that food because they know it's not going to travel well. So there are people who will persevere and get that for the short term. But I think long term, um, yeah, I, I don't know how that food would travel very well. I think, I think you really have to look at your, uh, do a thorough market study and really understand what you're getting into here because restaurants have never been easy way before this started, right? So if you're now coming in and thinking, I want to set up a new restaurant, you have to know your positioning, your price point in the area, who, who is going to be coming there, but also really think about your, your takeaway strategy because if this is, we're still dealing with this issue six months to a year from now, probably 30 to 40 percent of your menu still might be takeaway so you have to think where is your geographical reach from there but i think even before you get into the takeaway it's also thinking about really if you're going to set up a restaurant who are you trying to attract here what's the kind of food is it is there really this is the time for whatever concept you have 
So people like us come in and try and help assist that. You know, we understand different segments of the restaurant market and the bar market as well and think if you do proper research and develop a concept and, and benchmark what's around you and really try and hit trends, it, it can help and give you a fighting chance, I think. But I still think right now, six, six, in the next six months to open a restaurant is going to be challenging. I mean, uh, there are people who are doing it and I give them, you know, full pat on the back for that. But looking right now is a very challenging time. But I also know people who are opening small spin-off restaurants, you know, where they maybe they had a full dining place and now they can turn just to a small takeaway. And it, yeah. they do quite well that way. Support local. That's, I, I, that's the only thing I think I can say where people will get that message no matter where you are in the world, the region that we're in. Support your local businesses. At the end of the day, we do not want to have a large uh, food scene just dominated by multinational fast food restaurants or chain restaurants. You know, um, I really appreciate that about every city I go to is trying to find local chefs, local bartenders, what they're doing. And, and if anything, if you're a consumer or an, a, an operator, go support your, even your competitors. You know, we, we have to support and band together. Otherwise, what's going to happen is a lot of these restaurants will close. Cheap rent will be there because landlords just need somebody to fill in and you'll get, you'll get your Chili's, your TGI Fridays, your Kenny Rogers will come in. It'll take over and suddenly that's what we're going to be looking at is more mall food. And, and as somebody who, you know, is quite passionate about this industry, that's the last thing I want to see. I think there's definitely a market for that, don't get me wrong, but for what we do and the clients we work with, and I think a lot of the people we're friends with in the industry want to keep that independent kind of restaurant still alive and thrive, you know. And I can see in the hospitality in terms of the hotel market, them starting to outsource some restaurants and actually um, third party, but independent third parties will come in and occupy those spaces. And there will be opportunities, but you just have to persevere. So support local, persevere <laughs> as much as you can. I mean, we're only six, seven months into this, so I hope we're not having this conversation uh, a year from now, but you never know. Okay, so okay. thank you very much, Ben. No problem, thank time. you. Congratulations again on the new office. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ben. We're going to support local as much as we can, and we hope our viewers will join us too. In 2020, our event partner, Bangi Golf Resort, BGR, and Nissan Plus were planning to roll out a special industry event where we were going to create an experience for the food and beverage industry. But as how plans have a way of changing, we're going to have to do this virtually with more episodes from Matt TV coming soon. Come join us for a quick tour of what you will be experiencing firsthand. Okay, the idea for having this training center is um, it started in such a way that, of course, we, we, we have been doing uh, you know, high-tech production, making use of equipment and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do is also to make sure that uh, we are able to teach the new uh, people mm -hmm. on what's going on. That's why we decided to have a uh, training center. Okay. And at the same time, this also became, you know, as things get alive on its own, uh, we got a lot of uh, nice partners that came along. Uh, and eventually, this will also become a regional uh, gathering point. Okay. for a couple of all the brands to come along uh, where they can bring uh, some of their clients or mm. whoever it is to have a look at how things will look like when it's being put up together. Actually, how it's being set up is that we have the hot zone and the cold zone. So if we look at the hot zone over on this side down here, uh, this is basically a huge uh, exhaust uh, system over here. I can put any equipment down here whereby I can put a cooking range, I can put a, uh, what do you call, a, a, a bread pan, you know, uh, and uh, combi ovens and whatnot in this area down here and kind of move it around. Everything is supposed to be flexible. It's supposed to be flexible, you can move things around. So basically your, your trainer or your lecturer can be sitting down here 
and right in front you have you know different people sitting down here looking at the guy cook you know doing demonstration of anything that require an exhaust okay so on the opposite side we actually have all the core items which means to say that things that doesn't require cooking or minimal cooking that doesn't require an exhaust so down here we will have um, blast chillers, re-thermalization machines, uh, what they call vacuum machines. So you can actually conduct classes on sous vide, re-thermalization, vacuum packing, and whatnot down here. So, so that is the idea beside it. Okay. Okay. So, so outside down here, all right. but other than just being used as a refreshment area, we are also uh, showcasing a couple of concepts. Tirefax Anuga was held on the 22nd to 26th of September, when more than 37,000 people visited Impact Muang Tong Thani in Bangkok. There were tons of activities in the lineup, from live streaming sessions to unique dedicated features, such as the Tirefax Anuga Taste Innovation Show, the Tirefax Anuga Trend Zone, and the Tirefax Anuga Organic Market, to name a few. And as the physical event in Bangkok ended on the 26th, the organizers extended special business matching opportunities from the 29th of September to 2nd of October with the introduction of a new virtual meet. The show will be back in 2021 from the 25th to the 29th of May. And for more information, you can contact Ms. Lin Hao at the email displayed on your screen now. Well, that wraps up our first webisode and we will be back again soon. A word of thanks to our sponsors and hope that you join us as we look into the old, new and ever-changing FMB business in this new virtual platform. Follow us on the links below and we will keep you updated from time to time. From all of us at Mison Plus, take care, stay safe and goodbye for now.